and uh, Minister Wayne preached a great message this morning, and, and so we, we're so excited to be able to have another one of our great gifted preachers here at The Way. She is uh, uh, such a blessing. She was actually at the Urban Youth Workers Institute, uh, which is a national conference for uh, folks doing urban youth ministry, and she was emceeing that, and Pastor Tanisha was texting us pictures of her on stage telling somebody the truth. Somebody say amen. And so we're so excited to be able to hear uh, her preach the word of God to us this morning. Please stand to your feet then, everybody. Let's welcome the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Pastor Erna. Thanks, fam. I wasn't expecting an intro in my own hometown. I appreciate that. All right. I'm so excited. I do bring testimony. I was at the Urban Youth Workers Institute. That's about a thousand folks. They all work with urban youth. It's predominantly black and Latino folks. And they are so passionate about what God is doing among urban youth. And they, the whole conference is so amazing. They have a whole like graffiti wall. They have this huge art installation. They had dancers. I was very inspired, but I was also like, oh, I'm very old compared to you. They, were, they have this um, secondary stage called jam the hype stage and I was like oh I'm too dorky to tell people to go to the jam I was like go to the jam the hype stage you guys it's really good I felt very old but also blessed to be there so let's jump in we're talking about igniting spiritual gifts amen and I'm going to read to us um, in the lectionary the scripture is from Acts 16 so I'm going to read to us so Acts 16, it says, starting in verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Now, during the night, Paul had a vision, and there stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. So we set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, and we remained there for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she prevailed on us. Now, just quickly, because I know I just named a bunch of cities that it was meaningless to us, I'm going to show us a map of an old school map first. So we just have a lay of the land. It said Paul and his companions, they traveled through Phrygia and Galatia. Okay, so that's kind of these areas here. All right, there's Bithynia, Mysia, right? So just so you have, this is the Aegean Sea. Up there is the Black Sea. And then can you go to our contemporary map so you can see how that, what those modern day locations are? If you go to the next map, it should be there. Mm -mm, the next map is contemporary. <laughs> 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 just giving us an interlude. There it is. All right, so you can see that a lot of these areas they're talking about is what we know as Turkey now. And then when they cross the sea, to, the sea of the Aegean and end up in Macedonia, that's just north of Greece as we know it now. So just some of the geography so we have a sense that, because sometimes I feel like it sounds like, you know, we're in Westeros and like it's not like real places that Paul was at. We're still processing, right? It was just a week ago, <laughs> Game of Thrones. All right. So... We're going to be talking about spiritual gifts. So I'm going to take us to verse 6. This is so interesting to me. Paul has already done one sort of long trip where he's trying to uh, plant churches and, and help spread the word about the Jesus way. And we have to remember, you know, living in 2019, we're used to Christianity being everywhere. But we got to go back to when following Jesus and calling yourself a Christian it was just unknown. It was unknown. So Paul is out here really telling people about the Jesus way for the first time. 
And, but he's had some pretty kind of a, s- a successful and traumatic first round of trips, and now he's doing another one. And it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, that's kind of in the Turkey area, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, I think this is super interesting. As I was looking at this, is because Paul is like moving up in his gifting, right? He's apostolic, right? He starts new ministries, and he's an evangelist, and lots of people, you know, come to follow Jesus, and he casts out demons. But even in the midst of that, as he's moving in his gifting and has a sense of what his calling is, there's moments where the Holy Spirit is shutting doors to certain opportunities. That even in the midst of moving in all his gifting, he still has to be listening to God, and he still has to be submitted, and he still has to be willing to hear a no. And this was like, uh, this was a hard lesson for me to learn. I'm going to share some personal stories of um, hard lessons I had to learn along the way, all right? So, um, so I think uh, spiritual gifts are awesome, but they have to be housed inside discipleship, obedience, and character. So here's one of the ways I learned that. Now, we grew up with different traditions. So I grew up in a denomination that was kind of like mm, supernatural things, like that was for the olden days. Did anyone grow up in a church like that, that was sort of like, mm, supernatural gifts are sort of suspicious? Anyone? Those kind of denominations? All right. And we looked at the denominations that were always like speaking in tongues and stuff, and we were like, hmm. <laughs> right? And so it, has, did anyone grow up in a denomination where there was like everyone was supposed to speak in tongues? Yeah, we're grouping that down, right? So we grew up in dip, a spectrum of backgrounds, and for some reason we all looked at each other slightly judgmentally, yes? We all had that in common, at least. And so um, when I went to, to college, or, or actually I, I went to college and I did a summer program, and I got around this woman uh, who was, uh, I was working at a home for women coming out of drug addiction and prostitution for the summer after my sophomore year of college, and the woman who ran it went to an Assemblies of God church, and uh, that's like white Kojic. And um, so <laughs> she really felt like everyone should uh, pray in tongues. So she, and, and I was like, what, I- what even is this? And she was like, everyone needs a prayer tongue. And then before she even explained it to me, she just was like, you know. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I don't know what's happening right now. And she's like, pray. And I was like, dear Jesus. And she's like, not in English. And I was like, I'm so terrified by what's happening right now. <laughs> I was like, that's the only language I know. Um, (laughs) But eventually, through mild trauma that summer, um, I did (laughs) experience like, oh, oh, like what prayer tongue? I was like, oh, okay. And and so I was like, oh, okay, I I don't really, I was learning how to use that, learning how to like uh, take that into my prayer life with God. And then a couple of years later, I, uh, one of my mentors, he was doing more in time to trying to create space for the Holy Spirit in the ministry. And so, uh, and, and this is campus ministry, so we did everything late at night. So he would hold these 11 p.m. to midnight prayer meetings. And somehow for us, that seemed really normal. And in the midst of that, I felt like the Lord was like, oh, I want you to give a word in tongues. But not like your personal prayer tongue, but one that would have interpretation for other people. And I was like that sounds crazy. No, no. And uh, you know when the Holy Spirit starts starts to convict you? But I was like, I don't come from that context. And what if people think I'm super weird? It was just a group of like six of us, but it felt scary, right? It was just not something I had ever seen. So I left and I didn't do it. And all week long, I had that heaviness, you know, where the Holy Spirit's like, I'm not going to let this go, I had this conviction, and I had to work through my fears, and you know, you feel like, am I gaining weight? I feel like I'm like 30 pounds heavier over the course of this week, because the Holy Spirit just kept being like, when you asked for more of me, you went to this prayer meeting and made space for me, and then I came and invited you to experience me in a different way, and your answer to that was, (laughs) (laughs) that's right. That's right. So you being, don't be like a little baby, okay? <laughs> so I said, okay, okay, Jesus. So uh, if, if I'll go back to the prayer meeting, and if you give me that feeling again, then I'll, I, I, I'll just put the word out there. And he was like, you can trust. This is a small community. This is, this is the right place to do it. It wasn't a crowd of 16,000. It was a group of like five or six people I knew well. 
And so, but I was like, but what if nobody gives an interpretation? And he's like, yeah, well, that's how this works. It's in community. It takes faith. It's not magic. It's something where you're dependent on other people. So I went back, and then I did all that stuff. I had that sense that I was supposed to, like, give a word. And I was like, if it's you, make my right arm shake. And if it's you, do this. You know, I mean, just full of nonsense. I finally got there, though, and I, I was like, oh, guys, I think I have a word in tongues. And they were like, okay, why don't you? And I was, gave my word. And then they were like, does anyone have an interpretation? And, like, the next 45 seconds were the longest 45 seconds of my life, right? And then internally I was like, I hope these people are faithful and don't, if God gives them interpretation, they don't go wait a week to give it. And then I started understanding more about how the gifts work together and this interdependence and this trust and this uh, community thing. And then someone was like, well, I kind of had, I had a picture of this. And someone was like, oh, I had a scripture that went along with that. And then there was this interpretation that came and I was like, and that's, I, I, all of our faith increased that God was speaking to us. Amen? So that was a big risk for me. So then a couple of years later, as I was in full-time ministry, um, I would be in, you know, ministry meetings, and I would have a sense like, ooh, I should give a word in tongues. And, you know, I would talk to the person who was leading the meeting, one particular woman, she was a friend and a mentor and a coworker, and she would almost 90% of the time be like, no. No, don't give that word. And internally, I was like, why are you trying to shut down the work of the Spirit? <laughs> right? Like, I had come a long way since, you know, my senior year when I was all scared. Now I was kind of cocky about it. You know what I mean? Now I was like, mm, I got gifts. I got to use them for God. And you're trying to just put a bushel over the light that is my giftedness. <laughs> and repeatedly, I would get this sense from the Holy Spirit, and I would, but I would come in submission and obedience and be like, hey, I have a sense, maybe there's a word in tongues. And 90% of the time, she'd be like, no, don't give that word. And I was mad, and I was critical, and I thought her theology was just problematic. But one of the things, I was talking to another mentor, one of the things that became clear was that God was more concerned with forming a spirit of obedience, a spirit of humility, a spirit of submission, and that as someone who was going to be a, a leader, I was approaching gifts like I was on uh, America's Got Talent. You know, like, I have it, I have to let it shine at all times. And God was showing me, I gave you that gift, but using it in a way that is submitted inside of community is more important than you just letting it shine all the time and feeling so special. Yeah. And my ego took it well. Not that well. <laughs> but that took some formation over time. And so what's interesting to me is as I look at Paul and his companions, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit and doing God's work, but in the midst of moving in all his gifting and purpose, he still has to be able to hear no. And I think that's true for us as well. But when I was sitting here over here doing worship, I felt like God was like, hey, Erna, just not everybody is coming from the America's Got Talent school of spiritual gifts. Some of you have gifts and you're eager to use them and God is needing to form your character around that. But some of you all have gifts and you're over here and you're like, mm, that's not my problem. I'm not trying to overuse these gifts. You're trying to Silence, hide, you're afraid to step out and use your gifts. Jesus has been inviting you to come forward, but you have been afraid, you feel underdeveloped, you feel like you don't have the title or the role, you don't see people like you using those gifts. Like a big example of this for, for me was, uh, I never thought of myself as a teacher of the word because in my context, the only people who I saw called teachers were very cerebral white men. I grew up around the Presbyterian denomination, you know, so it was like 20-minute sermons given by very cerebral white men. That's what a teacher was. So I taught scripture for years and was leadership for years and never occurred to me to think of myself as someone who taught the word. And I think for some of you out here, God's been inviting you to use your gifts, but because you haven't seen necessarily examples of people like you using those gifts, you have stepped back into the shadows. And that's also this is a hard word to hear, but it, that's as self-focused as me over here in my America's Got Talent version of spiritual gifts. Because both of them are focused on yourself. Because both of them are looking at spiritual gifts as focused on this person versus how they're supposed to serve this community. So whether it's you're trying to be too shiny or whether it's you're hiding back here, both of us need to repent and say, use me, God. 
as you will in your way. So if you say no, I hear a no. But when you say yes, I say yes. All right, and if God's speaking to you, I just want you, we're going to minister to people afterwards. So if that's you, know that I'm going to need you to stand up and get prayed for and give that to God. So Paul and his companions traveled through the region, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Another thing I was thinking about, and you hear some of this in, my, in the story of the yes and the no, is that it is true. One of the things that bothers me actually about spiritual gifts is that you can use them even if you don't have great character. I wish that wasn't true, but I think we've all seen it. I was at this Urban Youth Workers thing. One of the preachers said this great quote. He said, don't take the fact that God uses your gifts as a rubber stamp on your lifestyle. And I was like, I hear that. And I think, I think a great example of this is Joseph. Joseph is somebody who has amazing gifting from when he's young. But because he hasn't done his character work, when he uses his gifts, it actually causes more trauma and destruction to the people around him. And so we need to think about spiritual gifts in connection to character formation and let both of those things be grown up together. Because he has this, this gift of uh, dream interpretation, right? And he gets this dream when he's young. But because he's arrogant, he doesn't know how to steward that interpretation with humility. He doesn't know that he should just hold that and let God show him what it means. Instead, he thinks he should go to his brothers. His family is super dysfunctional. I don't know how many of y'all have siblings, but Joseph's family is one where, like, the parent is playing favorites. I think, I, I'm an only child, but from what I understand, siblings don't like that. <laughs> and so the dad is like, Hey, you're my favorite son. I'm going to give you extra special clothes, and I'm going to, in front of all your siblings, tell them how you're the best one. Not good parenting, but that's what's happening. Joseph has a dream, and in light of that broken family dynamic, he goes to all his brothers, and he's like, guys, I had a dream. Everyone bows down to me. What do you guys think that means? <laughs> it seems great, right? And this stirs up so much anger in his brothers that eventually they stage his murder and sell him off into slavery. So what we see is, yeah, his gifts are at work, but his character is so immature that the legacy of his gifting is harmful. And so we want to be people who work on our gifts and work on our character formation at the same time. Who, if we have gifts uh, that we're aware of, are willing to hear a no, and have gifts that we're aware of and we're willing to respond to the yes. Amen? All right, so those are some things I was thinking about as reading this this morning. So now let's look at what keeps happening. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Um, hold on. Sorry. Spirit would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia, went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision, and there stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come to Macedonia and help us. So when he'd seen the vision, he tried to cross over to there. So this is really interesting to me. So he hears this, it's this supernatural vision, but what I like about it is that he is listening to God and he obeys. Sorry, my notes got just a skadoosh out of order. Seek God in your spirit for a moment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they, get, they go, they head straight over there right away, and it says they're there for a couple of days, and on the Sabbath day, they went outside the gate by the river where there was supposed to be a place of prayer, and they sat down and they spoke to the women who gathered there. So this isn't like a Jewish, this is predominantly Gentiles, non-Jews, so there isn't a synagogue. So they're looking for, you know, people who are worshiping God, and they, dis they realize that people gather outside by this river, and that's where they go. Now, th what's interesting to me is, what was Paul's vision again? Do you guys remember what his vision was? It was a dude saying, come over here and help us. But when they get there, who do they encounter? Women by this river praying. Now, I think this is very interesting, right? They meet this woman, Lydia, and she's a worshiper of God. I think that when, sometimes when we experience supernatural things, 
we, what I appreciate about Paul is that there's this flexibility that he, that he knows he doesn't have the full understanding of what that vision means right when he gets it. And that if he hadn't been open to letting God continue to interpret how it was going to play out, he would have shut down interacting with Lydia. Because he's like, no, the vision was a dude. I'm going to wait for the dude who's standing on the corner trying to get me over here. But what Paul has is the vision was enough to get him from where he was to where he was supposed to be. But he continued listening to God so that he could see where the openness was once he got there. And I think sometimes when we have like supernatural experiences with God, we want that to be like a final answer, total clarity. Now we don't have to keep interacting with Jesus because we don't like that dependence. We don't want to have to keep trusting. We don't want to have to keep listening. We don't want to have to keep letting things evolve. Right, but we, that's the thing. We're always trying to move away from dependence on Jesus and relationship with him. Right, we're just like, mm, give me a supernatural vision. I have the vision, great. And then we don't want to talk to God anymore. But the way it goes is he gets the vision. The vision is enough to get here. But now he's still listening to the Holy Spirit. He sees these women by the river, and he's able to discern openness. And he doesn't get trapped in this one experience he had with God over here. He's able to let it continue evolving. Does that make sense? And so I want us, as we're people, sometimes we have these experiences with God, but we get stuck because we don't want to keep on listening. We don't want to keep on having to be dependent. We want to just feel like, I got that vision. I know what it means. Um, I was thinking about, um, about the need to stay kind of in an ongoing journey. I'm in a certain, I'm in a, I'm a little bit of a reflective spot because... Um, me and my husband are celebrating our 12th anniversary on June 1st. Hey. Let's keep going. Um, I re-up for one more year. Um, but one of the things I, as we're moving into this, this season of being married, and what I like about marriage is it just continues to evolve. But if I was like, mm, I married you 12 years ago. I know you. I know how it is to be married to you. I need to keep learning from you or evolving. That would be the end of our marriage. But I need to keep paying attention to who he is and keep listening to what he's telling me about being in relationship with me so our relationship can keep evolving. And I, that's like that with God, right? Uh, Chris was talking a little bit about trappings of evangelicalism. And I think one of the trappings of evangelicalism is it wants to turn following Jesus into like something you can say in pat, quick, little short answers. God is this. God is also that. God's vastly mysterious, but can be summarized in this sentence. Right? That's, we want to get that way about our life with God, but it's actually what I see happening here on this journey is there's these supernatural visions. There's also traveling with community that helps you discern that the answer to that vision is actually this group of women by the river who aren't waving for help. Actually, it's this super competent entrepreneurial woman named Lydia who's like a businesswoman, right? She's like, she runs that household. She sells purple cloth. That stuff is like the fancy cloth of that day, right? And so she's like a successful entrepreneurial woman who runs her own household, which means it's more than just your immediate family. Like your household is a whole like group of servants and workers who would be there as well as your biological family. So when, when it says her whole household was baptized, she's really framed as like the leader of that household. And so because Paul and his community right? Paul's a very shiny star, and it would be easy to be like, Paul's just so shiny, he just goes out there and is like, pew, pew, I do God's will. But he's out there using his gifts, but living it in community, yes. mentoring people the way that Jesus mentored people, yes. listening and discerning with other folks, and letting the vision continue to evolve. So when he gets to this grown, competent, entrepreneurial businesswoman, he doesn't go, just like his culture would tell him to, now you should keep looking for a man. He goes, the openness is here. This is who I was sent here to interact with. And preaches the message to her, she is open. And what I love is it starts with a supernatural vision, but it's moved forward by this quiet internal process that Lydia has, which it just says in her heart she was receptive. And then her whole household is baptized, and then she says, come on, I want you guys to stay with me. And they're like, we will stay with you. And they plant the church out of her conversion and out of her household. Now, that's not necessarily probably what they were expecting when they were over here and they got the vision of the man waving, asking for help, right? 
But because they listened and they let it evolve, they got to see an amazing church planted in Philippi. Amen? And so we want to follow that model. We want to follow that model. We want to keep leaning into ongoing dependence. We want to keep leaning into ongoing listening and dependence on Jesus. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. I, um, yeah, okay. Sorry, me, me and the Holy Spirit were just hanging out and talking for a moment. Um, I, I had other stories I, was, I felt like I wanted to share, but I feel like the main things that we're supposed to lean into, I've said. And so what I felt like was most important was not just talking about spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit, but making some time for us to respond and let the Holy Spirit minister to you out of the things I've talked about today. Can we do that? And so um, as we're responding, I want us to think about a couple of, of categories and that I want Jesus to, to minister to. Um, one is some of you have come from contexts where certain gifts, of, like the pressure to manifest certain gifts of the spirit has left you in some, in some trauma. And it's made you feel very wary. And I felt like as I was praying for us today that Jesus wants to minister to that so that you coming into this conversation, you don't, you're not stiff-arming God. Do you know what I'm saying? So I feel like God wants to bring some healing to some trauma. I also feel like God wants to invite some of us who have been holding back, particularly because we feel like others have told us that we're disqualified or because we've just been afraid. What I think is so amazing about spiritual gifts is everybody has at least one spiritual gift to use for the people of God. That's what Pastor Mike was getting at. They're not it's not for you individuals. Spiritual gifts are for us, y'all. And so I want us to begin to move in that. So let's just, um, can we sing Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, can we do that? And uh, let's just begin to listen to how the Holy Spirit might be inviting us to respond and not getting stuck in past trauma and not getting stuck in particular visions of what these spiritual gifts are supposed to be. If you are somebody who has experienced trauma where you felt like you you're holding God as a, at a distance around spiritual gifts because you felt pressure because you felt like you weren't enough like you felt like you weren't manifesting the gift that somebody said you were supposed to manifest and that's shutting you down now I feel like Jesus is saying I don't want your past to block you from what I'm trying to do in you in the present and so just raise your hand if that's you because I want to pray for you so if you're somebody who feels like your past experiences are shutting down your current and present experiences with the Holy Spirit, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I feel like the image I have is Jesus just wants you to, to like take the block that your past is because it's right in front of you and literally just step around it. Step around it in the name of Jesus. I pray for everybody with their hand raised who is feeling held back by their past. Lord, you don't want us to be trapped by our past. I pray that they, you would bring a healing, that your healing would allow people not to feel stuck in those traumas, but to say, yes, that is where I came from, but I am moving through that so that I can listen to you and be open to whatever you're inviting me into in the present. Bring healing, Lord. Words that were spoken over people that were false and untrue, bind those words up in the name of Jesus. Bind those words up in the name of Jesus. Bind those lies up in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would just have the courage to listen to the still, small voice of Jesus and where he's inviting you to come forward. Big picture, we can all ask God for more of the Holy Spirit. We can always be asking God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I just want us to do that as we're continuing to worship, to say we want more of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in this church and in our families and in our workplace, in our neighborhood. Let's sing Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord holy spirit you are welcome here. 
tradition. You know, Pastor Mike talks about how we come from a holiness Pentecostal tradition. And some of you, like having your own prayer tongue, that's not something you've experienced. It's not magical. It's just you can ask the Lord for it. I actually think Worship Encounter on Friday night might be a great space for some of y'all to just get a little more time in extended worship to seek God. If that's something that you want, just ask Jesus for it. If you want someone to pray with you about that, that's great. But it's not a sign of whether or not God loves us. It's not a sign of whether or not we're saved. It's just a way we experience intimacy with God, a way we can pray, a way that we can seek God. So if that's something that you want but you felt like you haven't been able to ask Jesus for, God's so gentle. You can just ask Jesus for that now. You can make space to seek God for that over the next couple of weeks. God will come through on that. I wore this shirt that says um, I'm about uh, empowering women of God because I do feel like many, many women, we disqualify ourselves from using gifts that we think of, that they belong mostly to men. Church planting, that's typically like the realm of men. Apostolic gifting, teaching or preaching gifts. And I just feel like I really want to pray for all the women in the room. I love that this church is a space where men and women can walk fully in whoever God has gifted them to be. I just think sometimes it's hard for me because I think externally I come off as like a strong, confident woman, but I still have all these internal voices that shut me down. And sometimes that's hard to admit because I want to be like, no, I'm not bothered by those things but I still am. And so can we just, can we bless the women in the room? Can we bless the women in the room? With the women in the room, will you just put your hands out? And brothers, if you're around the sisters, just, you can just uh, put your hands towards them. Let's just bless. Jesus, I just want to break the power of just patriarchy that has shut down so many women walking in their full gifting and in their full calling exactly in the way they were created to walk in it. Ways that they feel like it can't be them because they don't have a certain title or they don't look like somebody in a certain role. I feel like you are saying, not only have I put all of the gifts on you, but I want you to manifest them and walk in them in a way that is utterly true to who I have made you. You don't have to do it like anybody else you've seen before. Have that courage as well. That is what I had in mind when I made you. Jesus, would you liberate us? Would you liberate us from the internal voices that as women sometimes shut us down? Sometimes it's not even anyone saying anything out here. Sometimes it's we silence ourselves and I bind that so that we can hear you, God, so we can hear you, God. We wanna hear you, God. Come, Jesus, come, Jesus. If there's anything else that you want prayer for, I'm gonna ask our ministers to come up here. Come on up, we'll pray for you. You can turn to your neighbors. If you came with somebody and something's striking you, ask them to pray for you. But let's not leave here without doing our work with God. So if our ministers would come on up, and if you would like prayer, we want to pray for you, fam. We want to pray for you. I'm going to begin to move us to closing. As I was listening, though, I really felt like the Lord is saying that there's at least one person in this room the Lord is releasing a spiritual gift of a word of knowledge. So if you feel like God's been speaking that to you, I just want to confirm that. I also feel like God's releasing the gift of evangelism onto a few of you. You only know if you have that gift if you just if you start sharing and walking in it. And it doesn't have to be a kind of evangelism that um, is unrelational and not emotionally intelligent. We can walk in that gifting in a way that helps make Jesus relevant and accessible and appealing to people. So I just confirm that if you have a sense of that. Jesus, we are open to you in all the ways you want to grow and expand us as a community. Thank you that you're generous with your spirit and generous with your gifts and forming us in all the ways we need in order to walk in that. Amen.